Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. For those of you in the room, uh, it's a special opportunity to welcome Dr. Caroline Craven, uh, our newest hire, who is in the room. For those of you virtual, um, she, she is excited uh, to be here. Huge smile saying hi to Judith right now. Uh, feel free to reach out via email or in person um, when you do see her next. Uh, all right, Lydia. Lydia uh, Sauer will be moderating. All right, good morning, everyone. And I have the pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Mubarak Mohammed, who is one of our wonderful PGY2 colleagues. And I asked everyone about a fun fact uh, for themselves yesterday. And he said that he is defending the fantasy basketball champion in his league. So with that, uh, he is going to talk about physician wellness, unlisted occupational hazards. Awesome, thank you, Lydia. And uh, let me know if uh, my voice is too loud or if I'm not speaking up, um, but certainly appreciate everyone's attention. I do regret uh, not um, being present for, for this Grand Rounds. I'm actually in Ohio um, with my family for the last week of Ramadan and uh, they're just kind of scheduling. I could not make it in person, but. Uh, certainly happy to be here and uh, happy that you guys are all um, present and to watch this um, uh, presentation. Again, the title is uh, Physician Wellness uh, Unlisted Occupational Hazards. Um, and we will keep going here. I have no financial disclosures. Um, so in some ways, uh, struggled with the phrasing of this title. Um, you know, being a physician is incredibly uh, rewarding. Uh, we have the ability to positively impact the lives of, you know, others. It's a profession where um, self-actualization is, is possible. Um, and while there's a spectrum of roles within medicine, uh, you know, the job is not physically, you know, demanding as other professions. I remember my dad uh, telling me that, um, you know, work hard in education. Uh, you don't want to be like a construction worker or a forklift offer like I am and, you know, working with my back every day. Um, so just, you know, telling me to use my brain and, and making sure that I didn't have any, um, you know, work-related hazards. Uh, the job itself is, you know, well-respected in the community. Uh, you know, a lot of people are esteemed and admired for being physicians. Uh, and you make money, you know, to live comfortably, afford housing, transportation, um, food, you know, vacation, and, and fund your uh, child's aspirations as well. Um, so in all in all, it's a pretty sweet job. Um, and I think we're all lucky to, to get to experience this. Uh, however, like many other jobs, um, you know, it, it does have uh, some occupational hazards and, and certainly not at once, but um, little by little and through my experiences as an early uh, resident, um, you know, you could see like the, the impact of, of certain hazards, you know, amongst your co-residents and, and colleagues as well as, you know, supervisors. Uh, and this is something that's over time um, uh, kind of overlooked and oftentimes, you know, not by society itself, but, you know, ourselves in, in the profession as well. Um, and when many of these uh, occupational hazards we are familiar with, you know, in the OR, in the clinic, uh, physicians are exposed to infectious pathogens, uh, airborne cutaneous contact. Uh, it's not an insignificant cause of, of physician morbidity in the workplace. Uh, we know that, you know, electrocautery cautery and all of its um, uh, kind of carcinogenic uh, effect. And then uh, as Jordan Desitel, I presented early in the year in his grand rounds, um, kind of pretty excellently as far as the uh, musculoskeletal uh, complications in ophthalmology, uh, the force and skill required of uh, manipulation, prolonged standing and sitting in the OR, uh, and lack of ergonomic uh, insight um, that do lead to you know, injuries uh, among surgeons and, and physicians. Uh, so the Occupational Sef uh, Safety and Health uh, Administration uh, describes uh, five categories of occupational hazards. Um, I think we're all familiar with the physical safety hazards, which you know include anything that could happen in the workplace as an injury. Uh, the next four um, are described as quote unquote health hazards, where uh, unlike physical safety hazards, they describe risks of injury after cumulative exposure uh, to a harmful condition or substance uh, rather than a singular accident. Um, and then those are pretty self-explanatory as far as like chemical, biological hazards. Um, physical hazards include like excessive noise or elevated or low temperatures or radiation, um, that things you can just kind of, you know, see over and over again that can impact your health. And then um, ergonomic hazards we are well aware of um, as well. Uh, notably, one thing that is missing, though, are uh, the psychosocial hazards uh, aspect of work, um, which can, you know, have the potential to cause psychological or, you know, even physical harm. Um, 
our government, the, the OHSA does not list it as one of the kind of five core um, uh, occupational hazards, but this is just kind of the definition from uh, the Australian government and their um, co-equivalent to um, OHSA, which lists again, uh, psychosocial hazards as being an aspect of um, uh, the health and safety of their occupation. Um, so this was a, a recent article that I saw um, back in September, actually, and um, I think we got an email from uh, the GME as well, um, just saying that, you know, that day, I think it was September 17th, that um, it was National Physician Suicide Awareness Day. Um, and I actually didn't even know there was a, uh, you know, awareness day for physician suicide. Um, certainly, I think, you know, as we go through training, uh, we all have like many experiences with um, certain, you know, um, kind of the, the, the how hard work can be and um, certainly hear stories of, um, particularly with me like, as I started residency, uh, just, you know, in terms of the jarring aspect of uh, your mental health and, and burnout and things of that nature. Um, and certainly we all kind of are, um, uh, you know, have a cursory um, awareness that physician suicide uh, is a thing and it's higher in the, uh, you know, in our population than the general population. but uh, certainly not to the extent that, you know, there's an actual day where uh, you are um, kind of observing um, the amount of suicide that happens in the physician community. Uh, certainly there's a lot of risk factors, uh, you know, that sleep deprivation, long hours, uh, excessive workload, uh, certain financial hardships in terms of um, uh, loans and whatnot, and then legal issues uh, from a medical legal standpoint that exacerbate these issues. Um, but it's oftentimes something that's not really looked at, you know, in our community. And this is, you know, evident for me as well, which, you know, um, as a physician, I didn't even know, uh, you know, a day kind of looking at this was something um, that was, uh, you know, on, on the radar as far as uh, on the national community. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of take this time uh, as an opportunity for myself and um, uh, just, uh, you know, had the opportunity to pre pre present, uh, present a grand rounds where, um, I could kind of look in this a little bit more and then uh, particularly talk about physician suicide to kind of not only educate myself, but then, um, you know, other colleagues as well. Uh, so I'll start out with, you know, burnout is something we're um, all familiar with. It's a um, work-related uh, syndrome involving uh, emotional exhaustion, uh, depersonalization, uh, and a sense of reduced you know, accomplishment. Uh, these folks, Surgeon and Al, were kind of the first to assess burnout in, resident, uh, in residents and faculty. Uh, and the numbers are pretty high as we kind of all probably are aware of, you know, 30% um, of residents and um, almost 30% of faculty as well scored in a high range of emotional exhaustion, uh, more than 50% of residents um, and about a quarter of faculty scored in a high range of, you know, depersonalization. Uh, and then about a uh, fifth of residents and 10% of uh, faculty uh, scored in a lower range of personal uh, accomplishment, which, you know, is pretty eyebrows raising, you know, as far as, um, you know, we're all, uh, highly educated, you know, highly accomplished folks as well. Um, and then in terms of, you know, suicide, I think uh, we all know that, um, you know, female physicians are about like twice as high um, to commit suicide as, as compared to the general population. And then for males, uh, the hazard ratio is about 1.4. Um, in a recent study uh, surveying almost 8,000 surgeons in the UK, um, about 6% reported suicidal uh, ideation uh, within the past year. Uh, and then for the for that population itself among surgeons, uh, it was three times more common. Um, and the most probably, I guess, eyebrow raising you know fact was only a quarter of them uh, sought psychiatric help, and um, almost the majority, you know, sixty percent say they were reluctant to seek help uh, due to concern that could compromise their careers. And I think we all know that's true as well. Um, so I think I would argue particularly with, you know, the hazard ratios um, that we see um, and just for, by the fact that we have, you know, an awareness day for this in, in our profession, that it is an occupational hazard uh, for physicians. Um, it's the only cause of mortality that's higher in physicians than non-physicians uh, as well. And this was uh, the uh, study that I was citing earlier as far as the suicide rates among physicians um, by uh, Sherman Hammer as well. Uh, so, one uh, study that I wanted to kind of look through was looking at suicide ideation um, in medical school and, and medical students. Um, and this recent um, meta-analysis, I believe back about five years ago, or a little bit longer, um, showed that the prevalence was pretty high among medical students and it kind of started there. 
Um, so the prevalence was about 11% uh, in the medical student population. And then um, when you kind of extrapolate it out to the past year or so, about a quarter of medical students uh, indicated suicidal ideation uh, within the past year uh, based on that study. Uh, notably, this study also and, and other studies have shown that, you know, the um, uh, burden and, and prevalence and incidence of mental health disorders is not higher among medical students uh, compared to the general population. Uh, and then we know that suicidal uh, physicians face unique barriers to care. And I think we're all aware of just kind of the pressures and uh, from a um, professional standpoint, um, encounter, um, uh, you know, barriers not, not only you face in like, you know, general population as far as stigma, lack of time, you know, lack of access to care, um, but physicians especially have an added burden concerns uh, in regards to concerns um, uh, with regard to like confidentiality, um, uh, fear of discrimination and licensing, uh, and then, you know, applications for uh, hospital privileges to actually uh, do their job. And then this is a study by um, uh, Schenefeldt uh, and co, I believe out in uh, Nebraska and um, up to 35% of uh, physicians did not have a regular source of healthcare, uh, again, which is associated with less use of uh, these preventative medical services. Uh, the use of mental health unsurprisingly was also low, um, but certainly in, in, in the uh, research I was looking at, there was a little bit of a lack of information in regards to these patterns. Uh, there is a little bit more known about medical students, um, but again, they have low rates of seeking help with only about, uh, I think, a fifth of uh, those who had um, screened positive for, for depression using mental health services. So 80% of folks that are screening for depression are not uh, talking to somebody or utilizing psychiatric or psychological services. Uh, and then for those depressed students um, that, went, that did have uh, SI, only 42% received treatment. Um, and again, these are the physician, the, the students that will all, you know, become part of the, um, the workforce. Uh, and then the most recently or most frequently uh, cited barriers uh, included lack of time, um, confidentiality, stigma cost, and then uh, fear of documentation on the academic record. Uh, so then, you know, why do these barriers, you know, exist? Um, practicing physicians with uh, disorders often, again, a curt um, uh, encounter overt or, or covert discrimination uh, in regards to the licensing, the privileges, insurance as well. And then um, we know that malpractice insurance is a big deal as well, particularly as you're uh, transitioning to attending HUD. Um, most of the state licensing boards have um, removed questions about diagnosis or treatment um, toward questions uh, about you know, impaired professional performance um, at initial licensure and, and renewals. But um, uh, there are some uh, states, again, that still have kind of ambiguous uh, questions in regards to um, kind of mental health. Uh, and notably, the American with Disabilities Act has been uh, deployed in legal challenges in regards to these uh, medical licensing boards. And then there are questions in regards to uh, mental health questions. Um, so it is reasonable to infirm, um, uh, or infer rather that the physician's uh, concern with disclosure of mental health uh, records is, is widespread. Um, these breaches of confidentiality between physicians and um, not only as, you know, colleagues, but, you know, as a treating physician um, uh, can result in kind of needless disclosures to coworkers. Uh, these concerns coupled with professional attitudes um, that discourage uh, admission of health vulnerability are probably the driving forces um, behind the the um, the lack of you know seeking health um, and and mental health care in in, in the uh, medical setting for physicians. And I would like to maybe take about a thirty second break and uh, you know just for everyone just to maybe think about. Um, you know, a hard time in, in, in their training or maybe attending HUD. And then um, if you can think about maybe the re most respected like colleague that you can think of, um, someone that you really admire, and uh, if they came and, and disclosed, you know, that they were having, you know, these depressive thoughts or suicidal you know, ideation, uh, how would you react? And then kind of what your thoughts would be in regards to, um, you know, helping them out. And then conversely, if you had, you know, a, a colleague that was struggling, um, maybe you didn't get along with, and again, uh, you found out by some way that they were also having these same issues, uh, what your thoughts would be as well. It's just kind of a mental exercise for all of us.
Um, so in regards to the uh, risk factors, uh, certainly you have kind of the general uh, risk factors among uh, you know, the population itself. So biological, psychological, and then uh, social components. Um, overall main risk factors for suicide include mental illness and substance use uh, disorders. About 90% of individuals um, who end up um, uh, passing away from suicide uh, suffer at least one of these. Um, other notable risk factors include you know, prior attempts, homelessness, access to lethal means, uh, lack of an adequate uh, support system, and then chronic uh, medical conditions. Um, and then particularly with physicians, you know, in addition to these general risk factors, the, um, the elevated risk among physicians is um, likely due to additional um, uh, uh, population-specific factors among physicians. So uh, physicians are exposed to high levels of personal and professional stress. Um, you know, they oftentimes make life or death decisions, you know, particularly in our field, you know, life or I, and then um, constantly at the risk of malpractice as well. Uh, they also have high stakes, you know, conflicts, um, possibly with administration or colleagues, and then certainly from, uh, you know, licensure standpoint as well. Uh, that's something that's, you know, hanging over, you know, folks' heads as well. Um, so additionally, um, we know that medicine and, and kind of medical training encourages uh, stoicism. Um, so from you know medical school on, uh, we're almost taught that there's new room for error uh, expected, and um, our expectation is that we're you know able to perform at you know exacting standards, um, always putting the patient first. And then uh, trainees, you know, in this environment may believe that you know they might be faulted for vulnerability and uh, thus avoid asking for help. Um, so it's kind of ironic that you know even though physicians um, are typically better resourced than the general population, uh, there still remains like a significant barrier uh, to seeking this help. Uh, this is a study out in Norway, uh, just looking at the comparative uh, risk and, and protective factors that are related to SI among uh, residents and then um, attendings or specialists, as they call them, you know, out of there in, in academic medicine. Um, and these were kind of the main risk factors. Uh, the perception of need uh, to demonstrate competence um, was related to SI among uh, the attendings. Um, subjects to harassment, uh, oddly enough, was only found in, in the uh, attendings, but I'm sure, um, uh, you know, if, if you're subject to harassment, it's not good for your mental health in the workplace. And then uh, sickness presente presenteeism was a new word I learned in, in this study and it's basically kind of shown up uh, to work when you're not feeling well uh, was also associated with a higher left a uh, uh, higher level of uh, ideation for both groups uh, lack of empowering leadership was also associated with uh, higher levels of si for both groups and then um, uh, lack of regular meetings uh, to discuss um, just kind of the job itself and the demanding experiences at work were also associated with higher levels of si among the attendings This paper I reported um, uh, kind of similar, but in terms of just kind of uh, looking at more of the uh, protective factors, uh, and this was by uh, out in the UK and looking at junior doctors or residents. And the analysis identified kind of three main themes and I hope, you know, this is kind of the main uh, sticking point of my talk, but um, support from co work colleagues with regards to uh, managing workloads and emotional support. Uh, supportive leadership, including uh, feeling valued, you know, accepted trust, uh, trusted in uh, good communication, uh, supportive learning environment, um, and then uh, normalizing vulnerability in, in those um, instances were helpful and found to be protective. And then uh, finally, access to professional support, uh, whether it be, you know, counseling, CBT, medication, um, and having those um, uh, avenues kind of, you know, highlighted uh, were also protective as well. And then lastly, this is a uh, uh, stadium, Ohio Stadium, uh, horseshoe as we call it. Um, kind of a lot of my fond memories from college are here. Um, and uh, one of the fondest memories is uh, just hanging out with you know, a lot of my friends. And uh, one of those friends was actually a um, medical student at Ohio State as well, or an um, undergraduate, and then went out uh, to a medical school elsewhere. But, um, he was a, a, a resident um, and uh, just started his internship last year. And uh, I think we all um, kind of know where the story is going, but he um, 
uh, passed away from suicide earlier in the year. And um, anything, you know, anytime something like that happens, definitely makes you pause and reflect, uh, not only in our daily interactions with others, but, um, you know, just with the system in general, uh, you have kind of a multitude of feelings uh, from kind of guilt and shame to like anger at the system as well. Um, but certainly um, and just kind of remembering him and um, just kind of, you know, the wonderful life that he lived. Um, I just wanted to just kind of give this presentation as well, not only for myself and just to kind of educate myself a little bit more in regards to uh, the rigors and pressures of medicine, how that can affect us in terms of our mental health. Uh, but just, you know, mainly present it to um, you guys as well and, and particularly my co-residents um, and just make sure that you know, um, this is something we think about, you know, something that we try to uh, guard ourselves against. Um, it's not easy, right? Um, and we all kind of have battles that we're kind of going through, but um, just remembering just to be you know, kind to each other, uh, patient to each other, and then ultimately uh, supportive of one another uh, in this kind of, you know, hard life that we kind of go through is, is going to be important. So I just like to, would like to end with this uh, phrase here. Um, by Ian McLaren. He's a, uh, I think he was a pastor out of Scotland, but this is, is one of his most kind, uh, famous quotes from Kindness. Um, and just want to thank you guys for your attention and be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mubarak, for this wonderful and certainly very important presentation. Um, I actually have a question to start off with. Do you know if anybody has looked at the difference between surgical and non-surgical residencies and how the numbers of uh, suicide differ in those uh, specialties? Yeah, that's a good question, Lydia. I don't know. Um, some of the, the main quote, the main um, paper I was citing, uh, looking at uh, burnout was among um, orthopedic uh surgery residents and, and faculty i want to say uh that paper showed that the rates of like burnout were higher among surgical subspecialties um but i don't know if any um papers directly comparing um, si or suicide um, between uh, surgical and non-surgical specialties okay great i have uh, another question for you uh mubarak jeppetti um thank you for this uh, topic, um, obviously sobering, and, and thank you for sharing your personal experience. <clears throat> you know, you, it was really you and the other PGY2s this year that gave me some some new insight after all these years of being an educator around the, the intense pressures that you feel to not look weak, be weak, not be relied upon by your colleagues. And, and we all feel it in medicine, but it really, it really made me... Um, reevaluate where we are in this space of wellness. Uh, and, and I'll say this, I, I'm really grateful to work at a place that kind of abides by the Maya Angelou quote, which is, you know, um, do your best uh, until you know better. And when you know better, um, then, then, uh, be, you know, act on that. And, and, you know, whether it's the kind of meditation room we're creating for you guys upstairs, Griffin Jardine doing the best thing I think we've ever done in the program, which was create some admin days for you all. We can't just be beholden to residency has to be hard and miserable because we were all hard and miserable. We always have to do a little better. And so Griffin, uh, just recently at a, a conversation we had last week, he's, uh, you know, independent of this conversation, really kind of redoubling his efforts uh, around wellness and the, the residency. Uh, no one's better than Griffin uh, at, at kind of bringing a little bit of joy into the room. And, uh, and, and there's a reason why we have him in that place. And uh, anyway, thank you. I know we've got to get on to, to Brandon, who's, who's going to brighten our, our, our morning with some humor here in a moment. But sincerest thanks for uh, this, this topic and uh, always a timely conversation to be had. So thank you all. Right, wonderful. Uh, thank you, uh, Mubarak. And then we're going to move on to Brandon and to have something a little bit lighter. He actually didn't just give me one fun fact, but he gave me three fun facts. So I'm just going to read those off. Um, the first is that Dr. Chris Bear has never bet him in ping pong. His favorite hobby outside of medicine is sleeping. And then the last one that may even uh, be in context with this talk is that 
apparently his first word as a baby was ophthalmology. <laughs> so with that, he is going to talk about communication breakdown. Thank you, Dr. Sauer, for the warm welcoming. No, partially wasn't true. Um, so thank you everyone for coming out and thank you to the Moran for allowing us to come up here and present unique cases and talk about topics that we're passionate about. Um, so I'm a third year ophthalmology resident here. Uh, I'll be presenting a case today titled Communication Breakdown. I have no financial disclosures. So kind of talking about the background of this title and my inspiration, it, it really came from one of my favorite bands, Led Zeppelin one of my favorite songs by them. And for those of you who don't recognize this band, maybe you'll, you'll recognize some other familiar faces. And this is myself and some of my colleagues here who were involved in this case and they were really helpful. So I just wanted to give them a quick shout out. So this case starts with a 77 year old female um, from a transfer center call on a busy Saturday shift um, that I took this year. And there was concern for acute angle closure of the left eye. In regards to the information that we gathered from the transfer center phone call, this patient had progressive left eyebrow pain, blurred vision, headache, nausea, and vomiting that started about one day ago. She did say that she had a similar episode like this in the past after scopolamine patch use, but she didn't require any glaucoma drops, no laser procedures, no cataract surgery in that left eye. Initial presentation at the outside urgent care, um, intraocular pressure was reported to be very high, up to 58 in that left eye. And despite three rounds of max topical drops, as well as Diamox, which was instructed by the local ophthalmologist over the phone, the intraocular pressure is still elevated. You can see here the patient was seeing overall okay, 2060. Um, she did complain of eye pain, and the eye was reported to be red with a mid-dilated pupil. Local ophthalmologist was unable to come in, um, but he referred uh, that the patient be transferred over to the Moran Eye Center for a laser procedure. So we accepted the patient. A little bit of background in regards to transfer center calls here at the Moran. Um, if the patient is an established patient, we can typically just send them over to the Moran directly and we'll see them, they'll come here, we'll get a page and we'll, we'll see them in our clinic. However, if they're not established yet, they'll go to the ED or if they're unstable, if we need any imaging or anything more urgent. Um, so we felt comfortable just bringing her directly over to the Moran Eye Center because she's already established. And typically we get a page saying that the patient is here and we'll come see them. However, in this case, um, I did not get a page and I kind of went about my day. It was a very busy call shift. And eventually I kind of went looking for the patient in the typical waiting room. And also sometimes they'll be out in the main area. And when I walked out to the main lobby, I saw an ambulance in front of the Moran Eye Center. And I'm sure most of you are well aware, but we, we don't really accept ambulance transfers. If, there's, if they need an ambulance, they should probably be going to the ED. So I walked down. And it um, turns out this was our, our patient. They arrived in a stretcher. Um, they were previously stable at the outside urgent care. However, they said uh, that the EMS, EMS said that they've been waiting for over two hours and the patient has mentally decompensated and they're concerned for hypoglycemia. And they're here because they were told that the patient needs to have laser surgery. They've kept her NPO and also that she's due for eye drops soon. So after um, talking to the EMS, I, I take the patient up to the Moran Eye Center, the fourth floor from the stretcher. I put her in a wheelchair, get her some food, get her some water. I elicit a history. This patient overall is a sick patient, multiple different cancers, unfortunately, uh, as well as a resected schwannoma of the right side, um, which resulted in some facial neuropathy. I think Dr. Patel did some plastic surgery with her to protect that cornea. Dr. Mifflin did two uh, PKs on her, and she ultimately needed the cataract surgery as well, but nothing in regards to the left eye. An examination here, kind of some things highlight. You can see overall, she, she sees pretty well. She's 2040, so not quite as bad as what we saw at the outside urgent care. The pressure for me was actually very low. Um, so instead of 58 or 40s, despite you know, topical therapy, I got a pressure of six, uh, multiple different recordings, and I was very soft. Then on my gonioscopic exam, you can see here that the angle was essentially closed with near 360 degree um, peripheral anterior sneaky eye. The left pupil was uh, mid dilated, fixed, um, not reactive, however, no APD by reverse. Anterior segment exam, the AC was shallow. Um, importantly, it was uniformly shallow. shallow. Uh, again, the, the pupil findings there, and then this patient had a large cataractous lens, um, but the nerve did look okay. 
So here, I, I put an hourglass up here because I want to kind of stop and talk about how long it took me to get the patient up from the ambulance to the Moran Eye Center fourth floor to elicit a history and do an exam. This, this took almost two hours, um, which is a red flag. Uh, the patient was um, kind of falling asleep, didn't have the energy to get herself into the chair. She almost fell when I was transferring her into the chair. She didn't have the energy to keep her chin in the slit lamp. And I thought, you know, maybe she's just tired or dehydrated because she hasn't had anything to eat. Um, or, you know, I've saw patients with angle closure in the past. They're, they're nauseous, vomiting, throwing up. Um, but it, it really, it was of concern and things were kind of progressively getting worse. In addition to this, you know, I was also somewhat confused. Um, you know, this patient is supposed to be a patient with, you know, a red, painful eye who's throwing up, who's nauseous, pressures in the 50s, pressures in the 40s, despite max topical drops. And on my exam, the eye was white and quiet. It wasn't angry, and the eye uh, pressure was actually very soft. So when, when you encounter this, in, this situation as a resident, you should you know, do what all good residents do, and that's, that's call your, your, chief, your chief resident for help. And that's exactly what I didn't do. I, I went straight to the glaucoma fellow. <laughs> And that's Dr. Chamberlain, and, and he told me what he should have told me, and, and that's to call my chief fellow or chief resident. So that's what I did. I called Dr. Collin, and and at this point, Dr. Collin agreed. Um, this the story didn't really make sense. There was concern for you know acute decompensation from a mental standpoint, and also if this patient didn't need a laser at this time, I think I already got six new pages by the time I finished with the history. So I was also very overwhelmed. So Dr. Collin ended up coming in. Uh, he walked in the room, took one look at the patient and said, she looks horrible. This is one of the most sick patients I've seen. So we, we decided to do an actual physical exam, check her pulses, and we were concerned. So we sent her down to the ED directly. And once the patient got to the ED, these were her initial vitals. And take note that in the urgent care, she drove herself in. She was hemodynamically stable. There's absolutely no concern. Um, and she was supposed to self-drive herself uh, over to the Moran. So you can see she's very hypotensive. She's bradycardic to Kipnik. She was sitting in the 70s on, on a full uh, air mask, and she was also hypothermic. They also did EKG and showed that she was in second degree heart block. Um, baseline labs as well. Uh, you can see many electrolyte abnormalities, her hemoglobin's low. She's also hyperglycemic. And then per the ED note, um, she essentially said one thing to the, to the initial provider, and that is she felt like her head and her neck were melting into the chair. And shortly after saying this, she passed out and fell off the exam chair, became unresponsive. They had to do a rapid on her. They also gave her two liters of IV fluid, rapid warming protocol, multiple different vasopressors, as well as atropine. It's a very serious situation that escalated very quickly. Kind of taking a step back and, and, and thinking here about this entire case and where we started and where we've we've come, we have a 77 year old female, uh, overall unhealthy but presented to the urgent care with uh, stable vitals, complex past medical history. She was essentially transferred for further evaluation and possible LPI for acute angle uh, closure glaucoma of the left eye. Initially, her pressures were read to be in the 50s at the outside hospital. Um, they were instructed to do max topical drops, which they did three rounds of, um, and also one, one uh, oral diamox pill, and now the pressure was six when I saw her. On my exam, the eye was white and quiet. Was, the AC was uniformly shallow. I was near uh, closed off on my gonioscopic exam. The eye was mid-dilated mid pupil with possible phacomorphic component. Then lastly, she, she had that subacute kind of altered mental status where she was kind of slowly decompensating. We sent her to the ED. She proved to be hemodynamically unstable and required transfer to the MICU and resuscitation. So kind of thinking back and what was going through my mind at this point, you know, I had to take a step back to my intern year and think about actual, you know, medicine and this patient had a stroke. Uh, maybe, probably not with her, with her presentation, but possibly, you know, this is something that's life-threatening we need to consider. Could she have had a PE? Um, she's definitely a hypercoagulable patient with multiple cancers in her history. How about a heart attack? How about some type of arrhythmia? Should she be septic and we miss this? Should she be hypovolemic shock or dehydrated or internally bleeding? These are all things that went through my mind um, as she kind of mentally de decompensated over the hour or two I spent with her. 
essentially in the ED and in the MICU. Um, they did, of course, you know, work up for all of these things, including imaging of the brain, chest x-ray, EKG labs, and essentially ruled all of these things out. So at this point, we still, you know, did not know what was going on. And fortunately, you know, I had to continue with my call shift. Um, so fast forwarding a little bit, Dr. Polsky was our consult resident. She was able to see the patient the next day in the MICU and um, the patient was transferred to the MICU for further support, you know, continued fluid resuscitation, vasopressive support. Eventually the patient's electrolytes did normalize, the mental status did improve. That next day, the ophthalmology exam was overall unchanged. Pressure was still low, um, despite being off all drops. And importantly, once the patient's mental status has improved, we were able to elicit more of a history from her. And we found out, um, and this is a direct quote from the patient, that the EMS gave her three different drops. These were the max topical drops every five minutes while in the ambulance for about three hours. So for all us residents who just took OCAPs, thinking about, you know, not only the ocular, but the systemic side effects of topical glaucoma drops, it should be no surprise that you know, this is a case of systemic toxicity from glaucoma drops. Um, if, you know, patients receiving bromonidine, timolol, dorzolamide, latanoprost every five minutes for three hours, um, it, it, there's no surprise, you know, the things that we learn about with bromonidine and how it penetrates the blood brain barrier and causes respiratory depression, encephalopathy, these things were all occurring um, right in front of my eyes. And then, you know, in addition to Tim Law, beta block toxicities, you know, some basic things we learn in medical school and how that can affect um, the cardiovascular system, the lungs, the metabolic system, electrolytes, and so forth. So going back to the differential, uh, this patient ended up being diagnosed with systemic bromonidine and timolol toxicity, diagnosis of exclusion. A quick follow-up here. So while the patient was still inpatient, we brought her over to our glaucoma clinic when she was stabilized. See Dr. Zabriskie, he did an LPI of that left eye, but the, the um, AC was still shallow. And at that point, he agreed, he thought this was likely phacomorphic. So uh, when she was sent home and stabilized, we brought her back for more definitive treatment. I think this was a combined case with either Chai on Mifflin or uh, someone else here where they did, you know, cataract surgery, removed the cataract, created some volume, aeroplasty, gonio dissection, and also repeated the LPI. Now, the most recent follow-up, she was seeing well, 2015. Pressures are normal. AC was nice and shallow, or nice and deep, not shallow, and she was drop free at that point. And I kind of just wanted to go back, you know, this was a very humbling case. Um, I could have kind of dove deeper and this could have also been presented as an M&M, but when we're, you know, introduced into medicine, you know, we, we go into medicine wanting to help people. And one of the first things we do, um, you know, at our white coat ceremonies is repeat the Hippocratic Oath. And first, do no harm. I remember saying these words and it was really a gut punch the next day sleep deprived after taking a hard call shift, I, I read the ED note, and this was the first line of the assessment and plan from the ED attending. Um, it was a real gut punch. It, it says the failure to initiate interventions such as adequate history taking, a discussion with poison control and admission on an urgent basis likely resulted in sudden clinical and significant life-threatening deterioration in this case. Um, so this was a, a huge, huge near miss. This could have been much worse. Um, and, I, you know, it made me really take a step back and think about all the things that, you know, I potentially did wrong, the communication errors, all the steps along the line of this entire case and, and what things could have been prevented. And that's why I want to talk real quickly about our favorite kind of diagram here, the Swiss cheese model. And essentially, this is, you know, a model where it demonstrates that although we have multiple layers of defense, um, each of those layers still have flaws. And when the flaws in those multiple layers of defense or checkpoints to help prevent uh, misses or near misses. When those flaws line up, near misses can become misses and, and serious medical errors can happen. I mean, we see this all the time and, and we, we've learned about this multiple times. So I thought about what were the steps in this case that, you know, potentially went wrong? Where could have I, you know, improved to help prevent this? And what can I learn from this case? So the things that were, you know, um, on my mind, you know, the transfer center call, there's a lot of assumptions made. There's poor communication. Um, we did not tell them to, you know, continue drops until they're seen for three hours, but someone did, but we also didn't tell them not to. 
Uh, we didn't know they were going to be coming over in an ambulance. There's no communication there. So there's just a lot of communication errors in regard to the transfer center call. The paging system, it's an imperfect system. And that I think was kind of highlighted here as well. Um, you know, the patient was out front in an ambulance for multiple hours before I knew they were even here. Uh, the handoff from the EMS and, and myself, um, you know, I was not told that the patient was receiving drops for three hours, but I also didn't ask. Um, and I think I was just a little bit overwhelmed. So, and, and kind of shocked at the, the current situation. So this communication could have been better as well. And, and again, patient history. Yes, the patient had altered mental sadness. It was hard to elicit a history, but I think I had a lot of cognitive biases. You know, in my mind, this patient was a patient with acute angle closure. They needed laser. I had six other patients to see. Let's, you know, let, let's go. Um, so the first four, four topics here out of the five really highlight communication. And that's really the highlight of this topic. And um, we, we hear about this a lot in regards to uh, physician handoff and, and, and transfer of care between, between attendings. And it should be no surprise that almost 80% of serious medical errors do involve miscommunication between caregivers and patients when being transferred or handed off. And there's lots of discussion um, in the literature about things that we can do to help prevent this. And we see it in our everyday lives here with checklists, with the EMR, surgical timeouts. Um, there's also some mnemonics that we learn in medical school, nursing school, all kind of encompassing areas to talk about everything that's important in regards to handoffs. Um, In-person communication has also shown to decrease this miscommunication between caregivers and handoffs. And lastly, just closed loop communication, kind of restating what you were told and what needs to happen. Um, and one more quick topic I wanted to touch on, and that's, that's kind of cognitive biases. Um, you'll hear Dr. Marks talk about this all the time. You know, every bump is in a Chalazian. Dr. Zog gave a really good grand rounds in this a while back. And I just wanted to kind of quote here, cognitive biases are, uh, systematic, unconscious, automatic patterns of thought that may distort thinking and potentially lead to errors. And or in other words, how I think about this is essentially cognitive bias. These are our, our mental shortcuts. It's when our brain shuts off, takes the path of least resistance, doesn't do you know, critical thinking, you know, the things that we we're taught to do. And this in turn, um, these shortcuts can increase the risk for errors. So it's kind of real quickly going through a couple of biases that we're familiar about, but I think it's good to be reminded about and once confirmation biases, you'll see this a lot with history taking. Um, if a patient's coming in with, you know, painful eye with a bump that's kind of been oozing in red, they've had this before, you're already thinking Chalazian. So you kind of only ask history and gather history about what you possibly think could be going on, kind of neglect um, evidence that contra contradicts that. Anchoring bias, similar to confirmation bias, which is kind of how we prioritize or interpret that information that supports our initial impressions. And even when data or impressions are wrong, we kind of still anchor on those history points um, that may support our initial diagnosis. Effect heuristic bias. This is where we rely on our, our emotions or past experiences with patients or certain types of patients that may um, alter our judgment and decision-making instead of objective data. And lastly, overconfidence bias. And I think all of these kind of played a role in this case, but this is something, you know, even I felt transitioning from a PGY2 to a PGY3 is, I've seen this before, similar presentation. Um, I'm confident about this. And, and when that happens, that really limits our, our ability to dive deep into to history taking, consider other forms of treatment and even uh, diagnostic workup. So overall um, takeaway points is, you know, really this miscommunication highlighting this case here and most near misses and medical errors do result from miscommunication. Of course, be aware of the cognitive biases. I only touched on four, but those are the main ones. And lastly, I, I can't talk about a glaucoma case without, you know, bringing up, you know, the side effects, contraindications, drug, drug interactions. Definitely remember these things, slow down, remember to be a doctor. And, and lastly, I know Dr. Rorasco is listening somewhere. So I just want to touch base on the light trial and, and then the new data that we have out there um, to kind of show that SLT is uh, just as, you know, effective as, as drops in certain cases, and it doesn't have the side effects that jobs do. Um, thank you everyone who was involved in this case, all the attendings who took care of this space as well. Here are my references, and any questions? Hey, uh, can you guys hear me? I'm driving, driving to Redwood, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you so much, Brandon, for um, presenting this case. I think that you know, when we're, you know, when you're a medicine intern and they're telling you that you 
are responding to a code, your first, they say, first check your pulse. I think in our setting, in our on-call in clinic setting, my personal motto is now check your denial. Uh, I had a similar kind of presentation of a case. Uh, this patient came to me in my chief clinic. I had never seen her before, but she seemed very, very out of breath speaking in short sentences and just looked kind of pale, but her family was with her and said she had been like this for a couple of weeks. So I wasn't really sure she was there for, you know, VZV keratitis. I kind of continued with my exam, but she progressively got more drowsy. So I also just wanted to remind everyone the rapid response line um, for teams to come over from the university to our clinic is one, two, two, two. And not everybody is familiar with that. And it didn't also, it didn't always use, used to be the case that a rapid response team would come, but she actually did collapse in my chair. We called rapid response and she went to the emergency department and she actually ended up having a saddle embolus, pulmonary embolus, um, without any known vascular risk factors. I think the first sign in this case is taking two hours to try to get a drowsy patient up to the clinic or just having them um, arrive in an ambulance. I think that, you know, we are seeing a lot of patients by ourselves as residents, and that's definitely a safety issue. But a lot of these patients, even with acute angle closure, as you know, I send to the ED or even anybody who has any sort of medical illness, um, just sending them directly to the ED um, just because they can't have other needs. But again, thanks for highlighting, you know, all the things that fell through and you did an amazing job kind of identifying uh, your own and a lot of own other people's, um, you know, reactions and biases. Thanks, Dr. Hu. And I'll just chime in too. So I am listening, Brandon. This is a really, really nice presentation. And I know we discussed this a little bit at uh, the Journal Club with Teresa and the team and Cole and Sean. Um, actually, yeah, and you and Sean did a great job with this. And it is something we talk about at the VA because we do see sick patients. But I just want to remind everyone too, I, I've had very healthy individuals um, one drop, you know, start on Timolol and end up going going into bradycardia. And we were talking about this on Monday. So even when you take histories from patients, you may not have all the information. And some of these drops do uncover other systemic comorbidities that even the patients don't know. Um, and it is gut-wrenching. And I think one thing you can all do better is telling our patients to bring their drops with them when they go to see their medical doctors, you know, so often we, we tend to work in a vacuum. So thank you. Thank you for sharing this case and really doing a deep dive into our biases. Thank you, Dr. Orozco. Paul has a question. We can hear you, Paul, if you want to just. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I remember um, this kid. I don't know. Was this the one where my son started a fire in my house? I was going to mention that, but I didn't know. Yeah, I think right I when you called, my son has started a kitchen fire. So that's why I was kind of like, uh, can, you, can you call you? Anyway, I don't think I had the full history. So I apologize for not like coming, like coming, uh, coming in right away. I was just, um, but I, I did want to, and I think we talked about this afterward, but just for the residents, you know, if someone shows up, shows up in an ambulance, do not take the patient into the Marin. That is, you you feel bad because you feel like, oh, am I punting this to something else or someone else or, you know, should I be able to handle this? But th again, going back to what Dr. Petty was saying during um, Huvarik's talk about, you know, you feel like you don't want to put anything on anyone else, especially early on in your training. Like, you you should not know attending should be taking a patient from an ambulance at the Moran especially on the weekend when you're by yourself. Um, I mean, if they, if they drove themselves, like that's one thing. Um, you know, they got discharged from the urgent care and you set up a follow-up, that's fine. But even if, even if they were healthy, if someone shows up in an ambulance, um, they need to go to the ER. We, we, we shouldn't be taking that. And um, uh, just for, if and this ever happens to residents, even if they've been sitting there for two hours, tell them, you know, go around the corner, I'll see the patient, but they need to go to the ER. We just... We can't take that risk for the patients. Totally agree. Thanks, Dr. Chamberlain. Great, great talk. Any other questions? And then we have one more speaker today. Um, the last speaker is Forrest Hamrick. He is a, a, a PGY1 uh, medical, uh, uh, PGY1 resident in the neurological service. And his fun fact is that he lived for one year in Mozambique. And he's going to talk about ocular manifestations of intracranial cavernous malformations. Okay, I appreciate the chance to be able to speak today. Um, 
we always try to tie this into something neurosurgical. And uh, today I'll be speaking about ocular presentations of cavernous malformations. Um, and it starts with a case of a 26 year old female who had no past medical history other than a recent viral illness for which uh, she was febrile three weeks previous to her encounter with neuro-ophthalmology. And she had 10 days of intermittent vertical diplopia for which she was seeing neuro-ophthalmology and it was interfering with her work. She was a data processor. Um, her vital signs were within normal limits and you can see her visual acuity there and her best corrected visual acuity um, corrected to 2020 in both eyes with pinhole. Um, she had no recent travel, no smoking, alcohol or other drug use. Um, but on her exam, her extra extraocular eye movements revealed a vertical um, gaze palsy, which actually um, improved with uh, testing the vestibular ocular reflex. And she did have some subtle convergence movements when performing up gaze, um, but her slit lamp and fundus exams were within normal limits. Um, the differential diagnosis for someone with isolated vertical gaze palsy obviously brings up um, supranuclear etiologies such as a mass or demyelination. And we also considered less likely on the, um, on the differential was mycena gravis or thyroid eye disease. And again, convergence spasm was thought to be less likely. It was not classic for this, but that was considered. And so um, an MRI was performed, revealing this lesion here on um, axial T1 on the left and a coronal T1 imaging on the right. Um, this is post-contrast. And this lesion um, was correlated with a finding on SWI sequencing. Um, you can see at the very, uh, the, the midbrain there, this lesion on SWI, which is classic for a cavernous malformation. And just to show some still images, this is two different slices on SWI imaging, um, revealing this cavernous malformation. And just to review some of the anatomy associated with um, this vertical gaze palsy and this finding on MRI, the, some of the control centers for vertical gaze are located in the rostral interstitial nucleus of the medial longitudinal fasciculus and the interstitial nucleus of Cajal and the posterior commissure. And um, looking at a, another section here, showing the interaction between, the, um, between these centers and the posterior commissure. Um, controlling the superior oblique and the, and the motions of the superior and inferior rectus. Uh, just to briefly, briefly review the epidemiology of cavernous malformations, the prevalence in the overall population is 0.5%. And um, if a patient presents to the neurosurgical clinic with an intracranial vascular abnormality, they'll represent 5 to 15% of all vascular abnormalities that present to us. And the majority are supertentorial. And they'll often present with seizures if they're in this location, but they're around 10 to 23% present in the uh, posterior fossa. And the most common risk factors are a family history because they, they run an autosomal dominant incomplete penetrance pattern um, with a variable expression. And 30 to 50% of these cavernous malformations are familial. The majority have um, a CCM1 on chromosome 7Q. And they're also more common in the Hispanic population, especially the, um, the familial. And so the natural history of cavernous malformations, they, there's a one to 2% bleeding risk per year. And so patients who are very young have an overall higher cumulative um, risk of having a bleed. And that's when they most often present is having a, um, a sentinel event where they have a bleed and they become symptomatic. And um, the risk of re-bleeding is, is much higher um, than that 1% to 2%. Some have quoted 8%. Some have quoted up to 30% higher risk of bleeding after there's, there's one event. And um, the risk of bleeding may be higher in brainstem lesions. However, this could be simply due to the fact that they are more likely to be um, symptomatic if they do bleed. And um, they may be trauma-induced. Obviously, patients with these lesions should be counseled to uh, um, avoid head trauma. And uh, they may develop in the brain or spine after radiation. 40% are associated with venous abnormalities, which when they're surgically resected should be left alone. And they most often present in the third to fifth decades. Um, and then common presentations, they're most often asymptomatic until a bleeding event and they will cause seizures most often. But um, obviously in the brainstem, they often present with diplopia for which neuro-ophthalmology is often consulted and they're seen in clinic. 
by the neuro-ophthalmology team. Um, and so just a quick literature review. This is a um, neuro-ophthalmology um, paper, which went over nine patients who had um, posterior fossa and brainstem cavernous malformations, most often presenting with double vision, um, secondary to INO, third, sixth, and fourth cranial nerve palsies. And some of them underwent surgery. And uh, overall, most of the diplopia resolved on its own. And when they did not resolve at 12 months follow-up, they were offered lenses or, um, or surgery for further management. And um, the natural history of brain cement cavernous malformations, again, shows that there's around a 1% to 2% per year risk of bleeding. And having a, uh, a mass that's greater in size is obviously associated with greater risk of bleeding. And again, another paper looking at 690 patients found that the prospective risk of hemorrhage was at seven, was seven percent. This is patients who often presented to this group um, having bled, and so the risk of hemorrhage was higher, and it decreased after the first year. And obviously, if the if they present with worse findings, um, a greater size on presentation, or it crosses midline, those were associated with higher risk of bleeding. Um, so I just want to briefly cover the the important part is how can we counsel these patients when we find them um, to have an uh, brainstem cavernous malformation. The risk of bleeding is again one to two percent each year, and the bleeds are often symptomatic, but they may resolve on their own without intervention. They don't always need an intervention, but once they've had a bleeding event, the risk of rebleed is higher, and so they should be followed more closely. And um, they likely need a neurosurgical consult because management can often um, go in two different di di directions depending on um, how often or how many lesions there are, where the lesion is located and if they've bled. And monitoring will likely consist of MRIs, either guided by the neurosurgical or the neuro-ophthalmology team, every three to six or 12 months. And several studies have shown that antiplatelet or anticoagulation therapy has been shown to diminish bleeding risk. And this is mostly in prospective and retrospective studies that have looked at patients who were already on antiplatelets or needed antiplatelet or anticoagulation therapies. Um, and they had a lower risk of bleeding. And this is thought to be due to um, clotting in the center of the cavernous malformation causing venous stasis and um, the clots that form causing um, venous stasis and, and ultimately hemorrhage. And then patients should be counseled to get genetic testing in case this is one of those auto, autosomal dominant patterns of inheritance. And then intervention for high-risk lesions, they can undergo surgery, radiosurgery, or just anti-seizure medication. And obviously there's a, a higher rate of post-operative deficits if it's resected in the brainstem up to 50%, but this is center dependent. If you have a very confident surgeon who's done procedures like this before, um, the, the rate of post-operative deficits is actually much lower and can be in a safe range. And then SRS can reduce their bleeding risk, but this is after a two year latency period where the risk remains the same. And then for ophthalmology, um, once the, the lesion is treated or decided to be managed conservatively, corrective lenses, conservative therapy, or, ex, uh, or extra business surgery um, is often offered. And here's just a, a recent case that we did where um, the patient had a brainstem cavernous malformation bleed, and we opened up the cerebellum and um, resect, or I guess retracted the, the lobes of the cerebellum and found this lesion there, this raspberry looking lesion is the cavernous malformation. And one of the reasons why we went after this is because it was so um, close to the surface of the brainstem through the fourth ventricle that we could safely remove it. And it had bled at least. And this is after the resection. Um, so this patient, the 26 year old that presented to us with a vertical, um, with a vertical gaze palsy, represented after two months and her symptom, symptoms had resolved without intervention. And she's planned to follow with imaging and with neurosurgery in both neuroophthalmology and neurosurgery clinics. And in conclusion, um, these, these lesions are rare, but they potentially have a, a high risk of bleeding, especially in the brainstem, and they typically are symptomatic if they do bleed. And neurosurgical consultation is obviously recommended. And, and then 12-month neuro-ophthalmology follow-up is important to decide what symptoms, if any, are persistent, uh, if there's any persistent ophthalmoplegia, what intervention should be offered.